Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Kevin Shu. Uh, I'm one of the deputy attorneys at the New Business Practicum at Berkeley Law. Uh, and right here uh, for another uh, workshop in our 15 minute lawyer series. Uh, today's workshop is going to be a whirlwind tour through the trademark application system or the trademark registration system. Um, so, yeah, let's, let's hop right to it. Um, next slide. And so uh, we want to start with a bit of context and background information about the, the types of assets we'll be protecting in this process. Next slide here. Um, uh, there are many uh, different areas of intellectual property law uh, that will be um, uh, that, that you probably have assets in. Uh, the first would be uh, covering the trade secrets. Uh, trade secrets are a very broad, expansive topic that would cover essentially any information that is confidential and provides your business with some kind of competitive advantage over others. Uh, and so this is extremely broad. Uh, and um, uh, the nice thing about trade secrets is that there's nowhere where you need to file and register to prove that you have this trade secret at certain uh, time. Um, if that's all part of the internal documents within your company, uh, something like the Coca-Cola recipe or you know, the, the recipe for uh, KFC's fried chicken batter, of course. Uh, and so um, the, one of the advantages of having an asset that is a trade secret is that it essentially uh, remains confidential and it has the protection of a trade secret until it is revealed publicly. There's no uh, timeline, there's no deadline upon which uh, you are forced to reveal your trade secrets to the public at large. Uh, you kind of just keep that within your company forever, uh, essentially. Um, in contrast, we have patents. Uh, this is another area of intellectual property law that would uh, essentially uh, give your business a monopoly over a certain invention, some kind of uh, useful invention that you uh, created, that you uh, come up with. Uh, there are also other patents around uh, the designs, the ornamental features uh, that make your product both aesthetically pleasing, perhaps. And of course, there are also plant patents uh, around certain strains of uh, genetically modified plants or you know, just naturally occurring strains that are hybridized together. Um, but for most businesses, the, uh, uh, the main uh, thing that you would think of when you think of patents would be the utility patent, which covers inventions. Um, and in exchange for applying for this patent for uh, uh, revealing to the public how to, like describing this invention and how to create this invention for themselves, uh, the government grants the patent holder uh, essentially this 20 year monopoly on being able to make, use, sell, offer to sell, or import that invention. Um, so the whole patent regi regime is around uh, trying to reward the inventors for their creativity, uh, for their efforts at coming up with this new and useful invention uh, to ensure that they can reap the profits from that invention. Next up, we have copyright law. Uh, this refers to, or this um, protects the, what we call the uh, creative expressions that are fixed in a tangible medium. Uh, so these have to do with um, ensuring that whoever is putting down these uh, creative thoughts onto paper, onto something that is tangible, uh, it doesn't have to be like a stone, uh, like a piece of paper. Uh, it could be literally written on this whiteboard. If I were to draw a doodle, I would immediately receive copyright protection. Um, uh, however, it does need to be recorded somewhere. Uh, if we were not being recorded on video, <laughs> uh, my words as they come out uh, would not be copyright protected. Uh, but now that they are, uh, it is stored in some kind of hard drive, fixed in the tangible medium, and therefore I would own the copyright to that, uh, to that work. Um, uh, additionally, copyright, things that are covered under copyright, um, uh, you would receive copyright protection kind of immediately once it is fixed in a tangible medium. However, in order to uh, really enforce, uh, have some legal teeth of, behind the enforcement mechanism against copyright infringement, you'd want to register with the U.S. Copyright Office. And this is in contrast to a trade secret where you would keep that uh, all internally. Uh, and then finally, we have trademarks reason why you're all here uh, when it comes to trademark registration. Um, uh, unlike the other areas of, of IP law where the goal is to uh, ensure you know, either fair business practices or rewarding financially the, the creator of that work, uh, trademarks actually stem from uh, this desire to protect consumers. Uh, and the goal is really to protect against customer confusion. 
because as you can imagine, if businesses were uh, naming similar goods and services uh, in a similar manner, <laughs> uh, then many consumers would be very confused uh, why there are so many different versions of Apple phones, uh, and some of them are terrible, and some of them are really great. <laughs> um, and so the idea is that uh, we as a society want to make sure that customers uh, can, if they, if there is some kind of distinct symbol or phrase, uh, some something that signifies the source or origin of a particular good or service, want to create the system so that uh, other players within that marketplace aren't able to ride on the coattails of other companies' reputations uh, without uh, some kind of uh, assurance that the goods and services are actually from that origin. Um, so uh, the question is, you know, whether your company actually needs uh, a trademark versus a service mark. Um, so uh, one distinction you want to make is that the trademarks themselves uh, generally will protect goods um, that you are using. Uh, so if you are selling a good that uh, is where you're using a certain mark, whether it's a logo or a slogan, a phrase, catchphrase, uh, in selling a good, that would be a trademark. Uh, whereas if you are using a, a symbol or a logo, a logo, a word or a phrase in connection with selling a service, that would be a service mark. Uh, but in practice, uh, there's not a real distinction. Um, the uh, Both would be referred to as trademarks, uh, just for ease of, ease of talking about it. <laughs> um, and uh, it would be you would be going through the same process through the, the registration process. Uh, but there are certain differences in the type of evidence you have to show to back up that you're actually using this mark as we'll see in later slides. Uh, and so uh, this process itself, you can complete this registration online uh, in a, a fairly streamlined process. There are different tiers of pricing where you would file these applications, uh, depending on how well essentially that you fit into the streamlined process <laughs> that the USPTO has set up. Um, we'll see kind of differences in later slides, uh, but essentially boils down to whether uh, the USPTO would have to deploy additional resources to essentially uh, make a custom job of evaluating your trademark registration. So, uh, and so you might be wondering, like, why should I get a registered trademark? <laughs> um, the, the, the bottom line is that um, uh, it kind of all goes back to this protection of, against customer confusion. Okay? Uh, the goal is to uh, provide notice to the public that you are using this particular mark in commerce uh, for in connection with this particular good or service. And you want to declare that nationally. Uh, ideally, you'd be able to carve out that brand uh, for yourself across the country. Right? Um, however, uh, there, you, there might be some unfairness if there weren't a registration uh, because if you're based in California and someone else is using that mark in a similar way all the way in Florida, it might not necessarily be the case that they should have been on notice uh, prior to using that mark. Okay, so we have this trademark system. Um, the major downsides of not registering uh, kind of boil down to uh, essentially not being able to carve out that, that logo or symbol or word for your particular business. Uh, and at the Kind of far end of the negative spectrum is the potential for pivoting in terms of renaming uh, all of the marketing materials that you produced, uh, especially the physical, tangible ones that would require investment in hardware and you know, operational expenses to actually rebrand all of the you know, physical signs and uh, flyers and stuff. <laughs> um, ideally, uh, a little bit of preventative medicine in the form of trademark research I could have prevented that. Um, as well as just the, the switching costs for your existing you know, loyal customer base. Uh, they might be confused if you were called one business one day and then you change your name. Uh, there's a lot of goodwill and reputation that might have been lost in that exchange. Right? Um, uh, additionally, you have this presumption of ownership if you are the registered owner of that mark. Um, and so this can help uh, first you know, deter potential bad actors uh, who might want to ride on your reputation. Uh, but also just to, to give notice to everyone uh, that uh, uh, you are using that mark in a certain way uh, so that you can uh, uh, kind of better ensure a virtuous cycle of friendly business competition without um, relying on <laughs> potential customer confusion to, uh, to help you out. Um, next slide. Uh, 
Um, so in terms of the steps to file a trademark, we'll kind of dive into the application itself. Um, so that'll be exciting. As you'll see, the, uh, the web design uh, of the USPTO registration process, uh, it's a bit dated, uh, <laughs> uh, but it loads very quickly. So very good. <laughs> Um, first thing that we want to uh, mention, though, is when it comes to the marks themselves, uh, there's the spectrum of uh, this degree of protection you can probably get from a mark, uh, from high to low. Um, so the types of marks that uh, uh, we most frequently talk about having very strong protections uh, would be arbitrary and fanciful marks. Um, so an arbitrary use of a mark would be using a, a real world word, uh, something that exists in the English dictionary uh, to describe your, your product or service, uh, for example, Apple computers, uh, in a way that is not, where it's not used in your everyday speech. Okay? Um, if uh, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak didn't start Apple computer and become widely successful, we, uh, <laughs> uh, this company that we know today is Apple computer, uh, there's no reason for, there would be no reason for us to associate the apple, the fruit, uh, with computer hardware. Um, similarly, in terms of fanciful words, these made-up words like Kodak or Xerox or Google, um, they just have no, uh, the customers themselves, when they hear these made-up words, uh, there's no reason for them to think of that particular good or service uh, other than their prior experiences with the company that is using that mark. Uh, for example, Google as a search engine uh, or Xerox the photocopier, uh, no customer would say Xerox, oh, of course, that's a copying machine, uh, unless they have experienced uh, somehow uh, the, the Xerox company as a printing machine, uh, as a cop photocopying machine in the past. Uh, next up, we have suggested marks, uh, marks that would suggest uh, some kind of connection with the goods or service, but uh, doesn't, uh, I guess, hit the nail on the head too hard. <laughs> um, uh, for example, this Ford Mustang. Is a fast car. Uh, Mustangs are fast horses, but there's no. Uh, uh, I guess there is a very attenuated logical leap that a customer could say to themselves, "Mustang, oh, that must refer to a car <laughs> because those are also very fast." Um, it's it's uh, you can see that the relationship is just more uh, distant. Uh, in contrast, we have descriptive marks where uh, this it does suggest the, uh, the connection between uh, this, this mark and the good or service provided. Uh, an example might be like cold and creamy for ice cream. Um, it describes exactly what the texture is of that good. Uh, and so um, in general, what happens is that uh, the mark itself has to acquire secondary meaning within the marketplace. Uh, so in order to, for you to receive federal trademark protection over that mark. Um, so essentially you have to do like surveys to make sure that these uh, certain customers, when they hear oh, cold and creamy for ice cream, that must mean Kevin's ice cream company or ice cream that comes from Kevin's ice cream. Um, another example would be things that are location-based. Uh, so Mendelssohn Vineyards, uh, this is a vineyard within the uh, city or county of Mendelssohn um, or uh, having the last name of uh, someone who is named Mendelssohn. There might be many Mendelssohns out there <laughs> who also want to start vineyards. Um, and so you wouldn't actually receive protection over that unless you can demonstrate that you know, these customers have this uh, logical kind of uh, uh, connection uh, between those marks. Uh, and then finally, we have purely generic marks. These just wouldn't be protectable. Uh, it's if as if I started a chair manufacturing company and I want to trademark the word chair uh, for the type of goods that I, that I sell, um, that would be kind of unfair to everyone else who wants to produce and sell chairs. Uh, because if I would receive the federal trademark registration for the word chair, uh, none of my competitors could use the word chair in describing their uh, four-legged platform on which people sit. <laughs> um, so, Obviously, that, that would not work. Um, ideally, you'd be in the arbitrary, fanciful, or suggestive side of the spectrum uh, in, in filing this trademark. Um, so uh, an additional factor to consider when you're choosing the type of mark to register um, is whether there's a likelihood of customer confusion if you were to register. Um, so uh, if there already exists a mark uh, in the marketplace, uh, so if you were 
uh, trade registering the trademark for your particular mark, you do some searching and you see that uh, it exists in other forms and other goods or services that are completely separate from yours, totally fine. Uh, that's why we have a Dove uh, chocolate, uh, that company that makes those delicious chocolate uh, versus Dove soap. Uh, those are wholly separate categories. It's very unlikely that customers would be confused. Um, and Sleecraft is a, a, a one of the several cases around this area uh, that go through the different analyses the court would use to see if there would be a likelihood of customer confusion. Um, uh, as we mentioned, you know, similarity of the marks, proximity of the goods to each other in the marketplace. Um, uh, one thing we to emphasize here is that the type of good and degree of care likely to be exercised by the purchaser. Um, if the purchaser is likely very sophisticated, um, if uh, let's say uh, if Dove soap were a you know, industrial soap where the only buyers of that soap would be essentially people who have been working on uh, construction jobs for you know, the last 10 to 15 years who know exactly uh, what chemical composition they want in a particular surfactant, uh, it's very unlikely that they would um, uh, think that Dove soap had to do with uh, a particular, or a Dove, that it would be very likely that these purchasers would zero in on exactly the, uh, the correct product, uh, and therefore there would be less of a likelihood of customer confusion, uh, even if there were uh, kind of similar uh, sounding names for the same types of goods. Um, so one of the things to watch out for there. Uh, and of course, we have some tips for doing that preliminary trademark search. Uh, you could go through the, you know, the, the usual search engines to see if there are similar uses or uses in similar industries or goods or services. Um, uh, for social media accounts, also a good source for that. Um, when it comes to like, domain names, uh, it could also be a good way to find out who owns uh, the, uh, the competing uh, use of that mark. Uh, and it might be a good uh, opportunity for you to get into negotiations to see if there's some way uh, both uh, your use and the other user's use of the mark that could coexist. Um, oftentimes, those are worked out by agreement uh, so that both parties agree that they won't start encroaching onto the other person's territory. Um, and then uh, you can also run a, an actual search within the trademark electronic search database, uh, we call it TESS, um, and it's, it's pretty easy to do, uh, at least for a basic word mark search, uh, and you can see at least whether someone else has done a federal registration of that word mark. Um, and so you, uh, what will be spat out is a list of other marks that are similar, uh, either using your word in a different uh, context um, uh, within a, a larger phrase, uh, but it will also state whether the registration is live or dead. Uh, it could be abandoned, it could be uh, expired for some other reason, um, uh, and you'd also be able to see which class of good or service uh, that falls under. Um, and so if they are in you know, completely different uses, uh, different, different industries that they've been used, different goods, uh, then you're probably okay. Uh, but if it's very similar, then uh, it might be a good time to think, brainstorm about other mark ideas. Uh, and so here's our table of the, the different filing fees involved. Uh, one thing we want to show is that uh, if you only want to correspond with the USPTO through like, physical snail mail, uh, you'll have to go through the $400 to use regular form, <laughs> uh, but if you line up better with their more automated systems, uh, systems that don't uh, require human beings on the USPTO side, you could qualify for reduced uh, fees. Uh, and yeah, now here we're going to dive into the application process itself. Uh, as you'll see, not the biggest uh, investment of web development here, but uh, still <laughs> loads quickly. <laughs> um, and of course, yeah, step one, you'll be writing down who the owner of the mark is, whether it's the uh, corporate or LLC entity, uh, or you as an individual. Um, here you'll also choose whether this is uh, a mark for you know, just a, a word mark, essentially a, a slogan, name, phrase that is uh, purely the text, uh, or if there's a logo involved. Um, and a point that we want to make on this is that um, if you have the choice between, well, let's say that you have a logo that consisted of words, uh, but it was in a stylized fashion. Right, like you have a 
them arranged in an arc, and there's a pictorial representation of your company as well, this logo. Um, you would have like the broadest protection if you were to uh, register the word mark separately from the logo, um, because you would be able to protect essentially every iteration or every yeah, variation of that word mark. Uh, whereas if you were to uh, trademark just the, the logo itself, uh, you'd have to, uh, the court would look at the similarity between the kind of design of the logo as well. And so that would kind of reduce your uh, uh, surface area until where you have some protection. Um, uh, but if you were to separate, if you were to register the trademark for the logo and the word mark separately, of course, those are two different filing fees. Um, so that we can consider there. Uh, and here's where you'd actually uh, specify the um, whether this is a standard character mark, uh, so the basic word mark, or a special form logo. Okay. Uh, see this click the bubble. See what I do. Um, this is for the logo itself. Uh, <laughs> uh, you can attach an image of the logo, and if there are words from the logo, you can protect that they're not there. Um, oh, one thing I want to uh, point out here is that uh, for uh, for certain types of applications, uh, you would need to provide evidence that you are using this mark in commerce already. Uh, we'll have a, a slide that expounds on that later. Um, but this is where you would prevent, uh, present evidence showing that you have indeed used this mark in commerce. Um, and so uh, here you'll attach some kind of image uh, showing that. It could be uh, kind of your mark on your signpost uh, just outside of your brick and mortar retail st uh, store. Uh, that would show that there is some service that you're providing and you're using that mark in connection with that service. Uh, you don't want to just uh, reattach your the image of the logo or word mark by itself uh, because that's not actually uh, demonstrating that you're using the mark uh, in connection with selling your good or service. Um, and uh, right there in lines of rub, you know, what, what does it mean that if a mark is used in commerce currently? <laughs> um, so uh, under the Lanham Act, uh, uh, this is what allows the U.S. government to, to uh, the federal government to regulate trademarks in general. Um, and so what happens is that uh, Congress uh, is able to create this trademark registration system federal uh, because there's this impact on interstate commerce. Um, and crucially, in order to register federally for federal trademark protection, uh, you need to make sure that you have used the mark in commerce in such a way that Congress can actually regulate it. And typically what this means is that you have made some kind of uh, for goods, that you've made some kind of sale across state lines. Uh, so you can demonstrate that you in California sold a good to someone in Arizona um, or uh, for services, uh, and this is somewhere of lower bar, uh, you've offered your service across state lines and you are actually able to deliver on that service uh, on that particular date. Um, and then here is, right, uh, so another component of your trademark application would be uh, these uh, selecting a particular class of goods or services. Um, you can see a, a list of different uh, classes and future slides here, uh, but they will kind of uh, delineate or describe the, the broad categories that your goods or services fit in. Um, next slide. Uh, here is a long list of examples there. Uh, you'll have uh, kind of a full list uh, through the USPTO website, uh, and some of the resources that uh, we'll share in a bit. Um, um, and then uh, you enter your contact information, you'll know whether you're approved or if uh, additional information is needed. Um, uh, and by that time, hopefully, you will be all done. Uh, you can <laughs> submit your credit card payment, uh, hopefully for that $225. Um, and that is the trademark registration process. Uh, if you have future questions, we're always happy to chat. Um, and uh, I should, probably should put my email on that. <laughs> um, we also have uh, our website, uh, ollielegal.com. So you should put that. Uh, it's spelled O-L-L-I-E-L-E-G-A-L.com uh, for additional resources around this topic. Uh, but yeah, uh, we'd always be happy to chat and hope that, hope that helps. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you have any uh, questions from any of the viewers online or, sounds good, uh, cool, yeah. thanks a lot.